Okay, so this is the last call for coffee and cookie. Okay, everyone, uh, let's get the colloquium started. Okay, so uh, this week it's a, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Liang Fu from MIT. Um, Liang got his bachelor degree in physics from University of uh, Science and Technology of China. He went down to do his uh, PhD thesis from uh, University of uh, Pennsylvania, I think, uh, with Charlie King. Right. Before going to MIT, he was a junior fellow at Harvard University. Over the past decade or so, Liang did a lot of uh, pioneering research on topological physics, and he won a long list of prizes, including APS Fellow and other things. I was specifically instructed not to go into the list. So without further ado, I give you Liang Fu. Great. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Jia, for the kind introduction and uh, in inviting me here. Uh, it's really a great pleasure. So, uh, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about some, uh, some quantum phenomena uh, that, uh, uh, that I think is uh, interesting. Uh, and, you know, when we think about uh, quantum uh, phenomena, quantum effects, we tend to think about uh, uh, as physics at a very small length scales. Uh, for example, uh, we know electrons inside an atom, their energy are quantized, they form these uh, discrete uh, bound states, these are energy levels, and it is from the study of the energy levels in an atom that uh, quantum mechanics uh, was, was born uh, more than 100 uh, years ago. And of course, nowadays, uh, there's a lot of uh, interest in, uh, in uh, how we can manipulate uh, quantum uh, particles. For example, the, the electrons are spin degrees of freedom uh, in, uh, for example, quantum dots, and how these um, quantum degrees of freedom can provide information carriers, and uh, you can use that for uh, quantum computing, uh, something that classical com computers cannot, cannot do uh, in an efficient way. Um, but uh, uh, this is not what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm going to uh, tell you something about uh, quantum phenomena at a, a macroscopic scale, right, at a human uh, length scale. And uh, uh, when we have uh, many, many particles, uh, they uh, can together form some interesting uh, phases of matter. Uh, you know, liquids and solids, and etc. And uh, 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 very often, uh, we can get interesting quantum phenomena uh, in uh, many particle systems. Uh, for example, uh, in a simple example like a magnet, uh, here the uh, the electrons uh, spins are all ordered uh, into the same uh, direction, and that gives rise to uh, magnetism. And this effect uh, appears in at the room temperature. So we really have quantum physics quantum phenomena at uh, macroscopic scales and at uh, uh, room temperature. Another example uh, is the uh, superconductor. Here, these are, uh, we have a, a huge number of electrons, and uh, uh, these electrons are very densely uh, packed uh, in a superconducting state, and uh, the average distance between electrons is on the order of angstroms, and yet, yet, uh, every two electrons are bound together in a very uh, loose way, and the size of electron uh, bound state can be many, many uh, angstroms apart from each other. And yet, uh, all the pairs remember that uh, they come from the same quantum state. So these pairs condense uh, to give you a dissipationless flow of current uh, without any resistance. So this is 
uh, what's going on in the, in the superconductor. And uh, these uh, quantum phenomena are well understood. Uh, you know, the physics of the ferromagnets understood by Heisenberg and the uh, uh, phenomena of superconductivity, at least in conventional superconductors, uh, understood uh, from the Bardeen, Cooper, and Schrieffer theory. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about some quantum phenomena at the microscopic scale that at first sight uh, looks quite uh, boring. And uh, this uh, is uh, so-called the Hall effect. And in fact, it has a humble beginning uh, from you know, the, around the end of the 19th century. And this original Hall effect uh, does not really require a quantum physics, does not require quantum physics, it's, it's quite uh, classical. So what this effect says is that if you uh, pass a current through a conductor and uh, uh, in the presence of a perpendicular magnetic field, uh, in this case, uh, you get not only a voltage in the direction of the current, but also in the transverse direction, perpendicular to both the current and to the magnetic field. So the ratio of the transverse voltage and the, to the uh, current uh, defines something called the Hall uh, resistance, Hall resistance. And uh, uh, so this effect uh, actually uh, can, is, is quite uh, uh, simple. You know, if you look at the, the classical laws of physics, when electrons move uh, in the magnetic field, uh, it feels a so-called Lorentz force. So the transverse voltage develops to provide an additional balancing force, right? And uh, this additional electrical field in the transverse direction balances the Lorentz force of a moving charge in the magnetic field. And from uh, this force balance, you exactly get this uh, Hall resistance uh, that is simply proportional to the external magnetic field and so it's B divided by N times E. E is electron charge and N is the, the electron uh, carrier density. So uh, this classical Hall effect says if we measure the Hall resistance as a function magnetic field, we should just get a straight line. And indeed, that's what was observed uh, back then, okay? Um, however, things became uh, much more interesting. Uh, you know, it was discovered in the 1980s uh, that if you take a semiconductor uh, quantum well, these are basically systems where electrons live in two-dimensional, you know, two-dimensional flatland instead of a three-dimensional uh, system. In these two-dimensional electron systems, uh, when you increase the magnetic field, you find that uh, the Hawk resistance is no longer a straight line. Instead, it shows all these uh, plateaus. And at these plateaus, the Hall resistance is perfectly quantized into um, H divided by N e squared, and uh, uh, N is, initially found to be an integer. These are the integer plateaus. And H is a Planck constant, uh, E is electron charge. So it's quite remarkable that uh, by measuring the electrical conductance resistance, we can actually uh, say something about fundamental constants of nature. We can actually measure the fundamental constants of nature, the Planck constant and electron charge. And this quantization is uh, extremely uh, accurate. Uh, so this, for example, H over E squared, the, the whole resistance, uh, is known to be uh, to many, many digits. It's around the 25 kilo ohm, but it's known so accurately. Um, and uh, so, so how do you understand this? Well, this is where quantum uh, physics comes into play, and that's why this effect was uh, it's now known as the quantum Hall effect, okay? So basically, uh, in the presence of uh, uh, external magnetic field, when the magnetic field is large, the electron's motion uh, in the two-dimensional plane is quantized into these cyclotron orbits. Right, because electrons, uh, uh, they, they move in circles due to the Lorentz force on their magnetic field. And the size of each circle is set by the magnetic field. Basically, the uh, area of an electron orbit uh, is, uh, is such that there's one flux quantum per cyclotron orbit. And uh, at the also, the quantization of the motion also implies a, a quantization of energy levels. So instead of having a continuous range of energy available to the electron states. The electron states, they form these so-called uh, Landau levels. Uh, they are separated by an energy gap, so a cyclotron gap. And uh, each Landau level uh, accommodates a certain number of electrons. Uh, this is called the Landau level degeneracy. And uh, basically, um, the Landau level degeneracy is a magnetic field divided by the flux quantum. So this means there's something very special, okay? At a magnetic field, uh, when the, uh, the, uh, all the electrons, they occupy uh, 
integer number of lambda levels completely and no more additional lambda levels. In this case, this occurs at a particular uh, density, which is a uh, proportion to the integer times minus field divided by plus quanta. And then if you look at the Hall resistance uh, at these uh, special densities, you find that the Hall resistance is quantized into h over n e squared. Okay, so that's, uh, so basically, uh, at the integer filling of these lambda levels, uh, there's an energy gap and the system go into a, a special state and this state uh, supports a quantized Hall uh, resistance. And uh, uh, sometimes it's more easy, uh, easier for theorists to think in terms of the, the con uh, Hall conductance, which, which is the inverse of this, and that becomes n e squared of h. Okay. Um, so um, this all looks quite unique to the physics of Landau levels, to the behavior of electrons in a high magnetic field. However, um, it was uh, recognized uh, shortly after the experimental discovery that the Hall conductance actually has a topological origin. Uh, it is uh, deeply rooted uh, in the electron wave functions. And as a topological property, uh, it goes beyond, at least theoretically, uh, it goes beyond the particular setting of Landau levels. Uh, it is, uh, it should exist much more generally. Okay, so, um, uh, you know, so basically the states at the different uh, uh, integer fillings of Landau levels are topologically distinct. Uh, you know, the, the electron wave function have different topological characters. And uh, in the most general setting, this, uh, this integer that appears in the Hall conductance uh, is no longer just the number of Landau levels because we can think about this quantum Hall effect even in cases without Landau levels. Uh, and the uh, most general way to think about this is that the Hall conductance uh, is a topological invariant uh, known as a Chen number. Uh, this is somewhat abstract, but I'll give you more examples later. Um, uh, the idea is that uh, e mean systems, for example, uh, Hordain uh, wrote down a, a, a toy model, uh, a zero magnetic field, there's no lambda levels, and instead, uh, this model uh, shows a conduction band, a valence band, there's a occupied and unoccupied energy levels, they form bands, just like the bands in any solids. They're separated by an energy gap, so this looks like an ordinary insulator. However, uh, this turns out to be a um, quantum Hall state. It should support quantized Hall conductance because the topological invariant, this, this Chen number, is, is quantized to be a non-zero integer uh, in, in this model, okay? So um, again, this uh, looks uh, somewhat abstract, but this is my attempt to explain, uh, this slide is an attempt to explain this uh, origin of the uh, Hall effect without quantized Hall effect without the uh, Landau levels. And uh, um, so if we think about the electron wave function, uh, the electron wave fu electron is not just a point particle, but it's a wave packet. And uh, the electron wave function, the wave packet has a center of mass, has a center of mass uh, position and a center of mass momentum. But we also should keep in mind that uh, the electron wave function can have non-trivial distributions within the unit cell. For example, in a diatomic uh, 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 atomic uh, crystal, uh, the general electron wave function is a superposition of the uh, of, uh, states uh, on atom A and on atom B, right? And this superposition is a quantum coherent, okay? The amplitude of these uh, quantum uh, uh, coefficients, alpha and beta, are set by the electronic structure of solids, and uh, this quantum coherence effect uh, survive uh, up to very high temperature scales, even to room temperatures. So when you apply an electric field, not only the center of mass of the electron wave packet moves uh, in the same way as a classical particle does, uh, but also uh, as the center of mass momentum changes, the distribution of the electron wave function within the unit cell also changes. And as a result, uh, there's an additional uh, velocity, okay? This additional velocity comes from the redistribution of the electron uh, within the uh, unit cell as it accelerates. And uh, uh, this additional term is called anomalous velocity, and it's entirely determined by the form of the electron wave function uh, on the atomic scale. So this so-called uh, anomalous velocity is uh, proportional to the, uh, uh, the, cent uh, the acceleration, the acceleration of the center of mass and to this so-called barrier curvature. And barrier curvature is entirely uh, depends only on the wave function uh, in momentum space. So, yes? So, uh, that's something that you also worry about when you write a calculation. Do you 
correct? Yeah. That's right, yeah. So they will effectively normalize the barrier curvature. So for they, they do not change the relative phase of the two. Or another way of saying this is that electron motion is much faster, right, compared to the ions. Yeah, that's, that's why it works, yeah. So, uh, so one way to uh, think about this enormous velocity is that you can think about analogy. So uh, when electrons carry a barrier curvature, uh, it's basically like a, a magnetic field in k-space. So this gives an electron wave packet a self-rotation. So electron wave packet is self-rotating. So when you have a self-rotating object, like a ball, Right, that's moving in air. It experiences the magnetic force, and this magnetic force pushes uh, the uh, the rotating object sideways. So, electron wave packet also, when when barrier curvature is present in the electronic structure, uh, electron wave packet also is self-rotating, but now it's on the atomic length scale. And when apply, electric field is applied, when electron is moves, and it also experiences a transverse force. It develops a transverse velocity. That's the origin of this non velocity. So um, if you look at the uh, Hall current, the transverse current, it is nothing but the s integral of the, uh, the sum of the non velocity of all the electron carriers. And uh, F of K is the electron distribution in K space. So uh, because the non velocity is already proportional to the applied electric field at the level of linear response, the Hall current is obtained by setting this distribution to be the equilibrium distribution, right? So even when the, in the conductor, the electron distribution is unperturbed, uh, because of the presence of barrier curvature that leads to enormous velocity, we can actually still get a current when an uh, electric field is applied. And in this case, the uh, Hall conductance is simply the integral of barrier curvature over all the occupied states. And uh, if we have an insulator, uh, all the states in the Brillouin zone is completely occupied, so we end up with an integral of barrier curvature over a Brillouin zone, and the Brillouin zone is a closed manifold, and mathematically, uh, we know that the integral of barrier curvature over a closed manifold is, is, is a quantized integer, it's known as a Chern number. It's in the same way as if you integrate the geometric curvature over a two-dimensional manifold, you get, you get a, a genus, the number of holes. So this explains the uh, the quantized Hall conductance uh, purely based on the, the barrier curvature, uh, which is a property of the electron wave function. It does not rely on any microscopic details, and it, it should occur also in system without other levels. So, um, so all this were understood in the early 1980s, but it, it took quite a long time to actually find materials realizing this quantum Hall effect as zero magnetic field. And, uh, uh, and that's what I'm gonna tell you today about. Okay, so, um, so uh, the, in, interestingly, uh, to, to find a path towards realizing this, this quantum Hall effect zero field, also known as a quantum anomalous Hall effect, uh, a key development is uh, the uh, discovery of a, a time rules invariant uh, topological insulators uh, in three dimensions. And these are uh, insulators uh, and, uh, but strangely, uh, they have conducting uh, surface states, and the surface states has very uh, unusual properties. The electron's uh, spin is locked to the motion, and uh, if you look at the energy spectrum, uh, inside the band gap between conduction valence bands, uh, you see these uh, relativistic dispersion, the, the massless uh, Dirac points. And uh, uh, this Dirac point, there's a two-fold degeneracy here between the spin up and spin down states, and this is uh, so-called Kramer degeneracy. It's protected by the, uh, the time reversal symmetry of, of non-magnetic um, materials. And uh, uh, quite some time ago, uh, we figured out that this concept of topologies is not just theoretical, but uh, it, it's uh, quite, quite ubiquitous uh, in uh, real solids, in real materials. And there's a way to predict uh, whether a material is topological or not by just looking at the uh, symmetry eigenvalues of bands. The, the, the parity eigenvalue, and uh, uh, so many topological materials were uh, predicted uh, since then. And uh, one of the uh, early example, and still probably the best example of a topological insert is this bismuth telluride. And you can see from the photo emission measurement that uh, there's an energy momentum relation that form a very clear direct, direct cone. Now, these are non-magnetic materials, but it turns out uh, 
theorists realized quickly that uh, uh, these time reverse invariant topological inserts actually provide a uh, promising uh, route to making uh, quantum anomaly effect. So the idea is that uh, these surface states are masses direct fermions, and once time reverse symmetry is broken, uh, for example, if we introduce magnetic dopants, uh, on the, uh, when these magnetic moments order ferromagnetically, it breaks time rule symmetry, it uh, lifts the degeneracy at the direct points, uh, and because spin up and spin down states are now no longer degenerate, they are separated by a, a, a Zeeman energy due to the uh, coupling to the magnetic moments. And then, this is described basically by adding a mass term to the two-dimensional direct fermions, and uh, uh, this actually immediately gave rise to a Hall conductance of one half uh, on a surface of a topological insert. So if the top and the bottom surfaces are acquire magnetization pointing in the same direction, then the Hall conductance uh, add up. Uh, so one half plus one half give you uh, one e squared over h. So uh, so this uh, is the proposal, um, and uh, uh, and uh, then in 2013, uh, experiments from uh, Tsinghua University uh, in China, led by Qi Kun Xue, uh, they made successfully this chromium doped bismuth terabyte film. So chromium is magnetic impurity, and uh, uh, doping turns this uh, bismuth terabyte topology into, into a magnet. And, uh, uh, and now the, the quantum Hall conductance is observed at zero magnetic field. You can see the magnetic hysteresis and the Hall resistance is quantized into H over E squared at the low temperature of uh, 30 millikelvin. So this is, uh, uh, so after, after so long, uh, we, we finally has a, a quantum Hall effect at zero magnetic field. And, uh, uh, and of course, uh, you know, as you can see that uh, you know, in the years in between, uh, we are not just uh, you know, laser focused on finding quantum Hall effect, but instead uh, the topological physics became, became a, a field of its own. Uh, and uh, by now there are many, many topological quantum materials uh, that were predicted and uh, discovered. Uh, and uh, also topological physics occurs not only just in quantum systems, but uh, in classical systems as well. And uh, you know, very early on, the work by Costellis and Salis showed that the vortices uh, play a crucial role in uh, ordering phenomena in two dimensions, the so-called uh, KT transition. And uh, also uh, Brad Madison uh, here, uh, there was uh, showing that uh, um, even uh, the concept of topology also applies to ocean waves, in particular uh, equatorial uh, waves. Here, the uh, rotation of the Earth provides the equivalence of the magnetic field. And the uh, equator, which is the boundary between the North and South Hemisphere, uh, is the analog of the, of the edge of a quantum Hall state. Okay. And uh, uh, this um, physics of uh, topological phenomena uh, led to the uh, Nobel Prize uh, in 2016. Okay, so um, I've always been uh, interested in uh, barrier curvature in non-magnetic systems. Okay, so far everything I've talked about uh, magnetic systems uh, that leads to the uh, anomalous Hall effect, uh, but barrier curvature also appears in time reversal invariant systems with broken inversion symmetry. So in uh, in that case, uh, uh, the uh, uh, the barrier curvature is allowed by symmetry, by, by time reversal invariant inversion breaking symmetry, uh, and it's known to be present in many materials such as uh, ferroelectric perovskite, transition metal dichalcogenides, and vast metals, and for example. Now, in these cases, um, time reversal symmetry still sets an important constraint that the barrier curvature uh, has to be an odd function of momentum k. So we can ha locally have very high barrier curvature uh, in different parts of the Brillouin zone in k-space, but if we integrate the barrier curvature over the entire Brillouin zone, for example, we get zero. So we do not get any quantized uh, Hall effect. So um, uh, one can also, again, understand this by looking at this formula for the Hall current. Uh, the time reversal symmetry implies that the uh, energy at k and minus k are equal, our barrier curvature is opposite, and in equilibrium, the distributing function only depends on energy, so the equilibrium distribution is also symmetric at the k and minus k, and therefore, if you look at crushing, uh, the Hall current is zero to first order in the applied magnetic electric field, applied electric field. Okay, so that's why the linear response Hall effect requires time reversal symmetry breaking. 
Uh, however, since uh, we realized uh, together with Inti Soderman, a Papado fellow at MIT uh, back then, we realized uh, things could get actually more interesting if we go beyond the linear response, beyond the linear response. So when we apply an electric field, uh, then we actually to a conductor, we get a net current, right? So we get a net current in the same direction as the electric field. So in this current carrying uh, situation, there's an imbalance between the left and right movers, right? There are more electrons moving to the right than to the left. Now, it's allowed, perfectly allowed, uh, to have right movers to carry positive barrier curvature and the left mover to carry negative barrier curvature. The states at opposite momentum K are allowed to carry equal and opposite barrier curvature. And uh, when there is also a population imbalance between left and right movers, now there's a net barrier curvature. And this net barrier curvature then drives an anomalous velocity and therefore a whole current, right? So in other words, this effect can, I'm talking about here, can be thought of as a current-induced anomalous Hall effect. So when you apply an electric field, you induce a current, and this current induces a net man barrier curvature, which acts as like a net magnetic field, which then further produces a Hall effect. Okay, so therefore, this is the second order in the applied uh, electric field. So for that reason, we call it nonlinear Hall effect, and this is allowed uh, in, in the presence of time rosal symmetry in non-magnetic materials. And, um, and just one line of algebra, we can show explicitly that within the simplest transport uh, theory, so-called the relaxation time approximation, uh, this whole current uh, is uh, given uh, by this expression here. It's second order in the applied electric field, uh, and it's uh, proportional to the, the, the integral of, uh, of the derivative barrier curvature with respect to K. Uh, over all the occupied states. So this quantity here, uh, it has a symmetry of a first moment of barrier curvature in K-space. So we call it a barrier curvature dipole, okay? So this formula is basically a, a, a generalization of this TKNN, this, this linear response Hall connecting formula to the nonlinear regime. So in the linear response regime, the linear response Hall effect is obtained by integral barrier curvature over all the occupied states, while here, it's uh, a nonlinear effect. It's obtained by integrating the, the barrier curvature dipole over all the occupied states, okay? So it's, it's as simple as this. And uh, 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 this effect, uh, again, because it comes from barrier, barrier curvature, uh, it's an intrinsic quantum property. It's in the property of uh, uh, electron wave functions uh, in K-space, and it's allowed uh, in uh, materials that lack inversion center, non-central symmetric materials, and the experimental implication is very clear. If you uh, pass a current through a conductor, not only you get a longitudinal voltage drop, but you also get a transverse voltage at the zero magnetic field. And even more interestingly, the transverse voltage should be a quadratic function of the applied current, right? So this has have a quadratic dependence. So any quadratic dependence, any second order response is, is quite, uh, quite interesting because it implies when we reverse the direction of the input current, we still get the same output, output in the same direction. So this means that if I have a, a oscillating input signal, like cosine omega t, I can get a net DC uh, transverse response. Okay, so this is a, basically a rectification mechanism. So it's a, we call it a quantum uh, rectifier. Okay, so, um, so you know, when we, uh, we uh, wrote down the theory uh, and uh, we never heard of this phenomenon ever discussed before, uh, but we couldn't find anything wrong with the with such a simple uh, simple simple uh, few lines of derivation. So so we we, we wrote the paper and, and it got published in PIL. And uh, uh, you know we, we thought about possible materializations. And uh, uh, you know, I'm going to discuss this Latin terawatt later. Um, but it took us three years, okay, for this effect to be observed. Uh, it was actually discovered in this uh, atomically thin uh, semiconductor constant that terawatt. Uh, this is not something we expected, this material, uh, by uh, Chong Ma and uh, Su Yang Xu, two postdocs uh, at MIT at that time, working in the lab of Pablo and uh, Jarrero Her Herrero and uh, Nuga Dick. Uh, and uh, uh, this is their experiments. Uh, these are atomic thin semiconductors, and uh, uh, one can introduce carriers by electrostatic gating, so turn it into a conductor, and when uh, passing a current along this A axis, one measure the voltage along the 
transverse direction. And you see that uh, uh, there's a, a transverse voltage is a quadratic function of the applied current. Okay. Uh, and this is the first observation of a nonlinear Hall effect. Um, now, uh, very recently, last year, uh, Jia Li's group uh, here, uh, they uh, did experiment on twisted trilayer graphene. Uh, this is a, a Moray material, again in two dimensions. And uh, uh, they were able to uh, measure the nonlinear response uh, in an angle resolved way, okay, by fabricating devices with many uh, electrical leads. One can pass current in various directions and measure both longitudinal and transverse uh, response. And here you can see that the, the transverse voltage again has a cosine uh, two uh, theta, cosine theta uh, angular dependence uh, that's consistent with the nonlinear Hall effect. Again, this is all occurring at a zero magnetic field. And the appearance of this effect in twist bilayer graphene is particularly interesting uh, because bilayer graphene itself is supposed to have a two-fold rotation symmetry. And indeed, this effect is absent at high temperature. But uh, uh, the appearance of this nonlinear Hall effect at low temperature implies that this two-fold symmetry is spontaneously broken, and this provides important insight into the uh, many-body states in, in the TBG. Um, so uh, back in this our 2015 paper, uh, we uh, predicted uh, one material, uh, this leptin teroid, it should be a promising platform for this nonlinear Hall effect. So um, this material is what I've been working on for several years since joining uh, MIT. So it's one of my favorite uh, topological insiders. And uh, it has uh, direct surface states, but not just uh, one, it has four direct points uh, uh, away from the high symmetry points. So in fact, these direct points are protected no longer by time row symmetry, but it provides, but it's pro protected by um, crystal reflection symmetry. So um, crystal re reflection symmetry is sometimes more fragile. And in fact, it's known that many of these six, four, six semiconductors have a structural distortion, which breaks some of the reflection symmetries. So we worried about this back in 2012, and uh, uh, this is taken from our paper. We showed that uh, when the structural distortion occurs, for example, along one mirror plane, uh, it will break mirror symmetry in one direction that will gap out two of the direct points. It provides a mass term for the, the direct fermion. Uh, and when direct fermions acquire mass, it generates a barrier curvature. Uh, so uh, now you have a, a pair of direct fermions at uh, uh, opposite momentum uh, due to time rules of symmetry. So you have an opposite mass term and you have an equal opposite barrier curvature. Uh, so this exactly gives you a barrier curvature dipole. Right. So, um, so this is our, our proposal that maybe in these systems uh, we can observe uh, this nonlinear Hall effect. And I should mention that this kind of a direct mass generation from ferroelectric distortion was also observed uh, in collaboration with uh, VDM at Havens Group in 2013. And here I'm showing you the uh, so-called Landau level spectrum. And all I want to pay, call your attention to is that uh, there are the characteristic, uh, the zero London level of direct fermions. And that's supposed to be at a, a zero energy independent magnetic field. But here, in addition to the zero energy direct fermion, you also see two additional energy levels that are independent by their field. So the zero energy states come from the remaining massless direct fermion, while the other two uh, uh, non-dispersive lambda level come from the, the direct fermion that now acquire mass. So this is, this is all, uh, all established. So uh, with all these ingredients, we expected this uh, system could be a good pro platform for this effect. Uh, and uh, finally, you know, in the March this year, uh, there's experiment from uh, a Japanese group uh, that uh, uh, studied these uh, let ting uh, terawide. Uh, in this system, when the, you are in the ting rich phase, this is topological insider. When you are in the uh, let rich phase, for example, pure let terawide, it's non-topological. So one can also do a, a control experiment. Okay. And uh, uh, they actually observed this effect even at room temperature. So this is a, a bulk crystal. Uh, the bulk is insulating, so the uh, currents is going through the edge. So in lead terawide, you see the, the nonlinear Hall effect vanishes, but uh, in uh, lead tin terawide, the effect is uh, very large. Okay. So, and uh, uh, these authors uh, further show that this effect comes from the ferroelectric structural distortion. So um, as you um, 
warm up the sample and you can see the hysteresis in the nonlinear Hall effect, tracking the dielectric distortion hysteresis. Uh, and uh, uh, also uh, in two different uh, uh, domains, the nonlinear Hall signal has opposite sign. So this could potentially provide a way to make some kind of a, 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 a memory uh, because these materials are conductors, so one cannot read out the dielectric polarization directly. The dielectric polarization is screened inside the conductor, but one can actually use the nonlinear Hall effect to measure the polarity of the of the distorted structure. So this serves as a as a memory. Yes. Ah, that's an excellent question. So, uh, so but but in the transverse, okay, okay, good. This is an excellent question. So, in the trans, the nice thing about nonlinear Hall effect is in the transverse direction. So, if one can really make the um, the the Hall bar right um, in the in strictly vertical direction, trans perpendicular direction to the current, then the linear response Hall effect should vanish. Right. So then there will not be any any, and also because the second order effect, one can use a, a, a current a AC current. Then the, the nonlinear Hall effect gives you a response at frequency two omega, and at the DC, while the linear response is at frequency omega. In fact, all these measurements are uh, using either two omega uh, or using a DC to pick up the nonlinear response. Yeah, that's a good question. Yes. That's that's exactly the next slide. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, so right. So. Most of these measurements are done at the low frequencies, uh, hundreds of hertz, you know, thousands of hertz. Uh, but uh, uh, we expect, again, on theory ground, uh, because of this transport uh, theory for electrons in the conductor is so well established, we know that uh, the Jude formula applies of a wide frequency range up to the scattering rate tau. For a typical uh, conductor at the room temperature, the, 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 the scattering rate is on the order of at least tens of terahertz. So we expect this, this theory, this classical, almost uh, textbook uh, transport theory combined with barrier curvature effects, which lead to this effect, it should survive at a very high frequencies, at least to a few terahertz. So we propose then that this effect can be used uh, for uh, detecting uh, the RF and terahertz uh, electromagnetic uh, waves. Uh, and the idea is that uh, the input RF or terahertz frequency will generate a transverse DC current, that the DC current can be measured, uh, and uh, this could work uh, without external bias. Uh, it could work in a very wide frequency range, and uh, it can have a very fast uh, response. This is our, our our dream, so to speak. And another possible application is that uh, uh, one can, uh, because uh, one can convert AC signal into DC, so this could uh, be used as a kind of an energy harvester to collect uh, energy from the uh, electromagnetic, like microwave or. Uh, radiation, right? So, so engineers are interested in so-called wake-up circuits, using a very small amount of, uh, of input energy in the microwaves to wake up some electronic devices. So we, you know, we, are, we are hoping that this could, could be useful. Okay. So in the last, uh, uh, right, that's a good question. So theoretically, at this point, oh yeah, maybe I should mention experimental status, yeah. So experimentally, there are some, very recently there are some attempts of uh, measuring this nonlinear Hall effect at, uh, uh, like, sub terahertz frequency, like sub terahertz. Uh, there are already experiments working at uh, um, gigahertz, like Wi-Fi frequency, and there are some recent uh, attempts of measuring this at uh, sub terahertz frequency. Now, for the uh, efficiency, nobody has studied this. We theoretically studied this. We, so we show that, uh, if this is related to the Gang's question, um, if the uh, whole angle, if, if I have a DC input current, then I get uh, uh, both the longitudinal voltage and transverse voltage. Now I have to worry about which one is larger, right? So uh, that's about this whole angle. So the usual whole angle is just uh, some fixed, fixed by external magnetic field. Here I have zero magnetic field, and the whole angle would actually increase with the input current because it's the whole effect comes from a nonlinear response. So if the whole angle can increase to large values, let's say you know, on the order of 45 degrees, then the efficiency will reach on the order of about 40%. So that's, that's our conclusion from this theory study. So, it, so that's why this, 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 if we can find this effect, large nonlinear Hall effect, right, this could be very useful for power conversion yeah, from AC to DC. Okay, okay so in the last uh, 10 minutes, let me uh, move on to the last subject, uh, yet another uh, Hall effect, quantum Hall effect, zero magnetic field. 
So, <clears throat> so in the, uh, again, back in the 80s, uh, uh, it was found that uh, as you uh, uh, get samples get better and better, uh, not only you get the integer quantized Hall conductance, but you also get a fractionally quantized Hall conductance. Uh, it's, for example, one third of E squared of H. So there are many, many additional plateaus. And in turn, these fractional quantum Hall effect uh, are very, um, uh, you know, completely uh, very, very profound. Uh, it cannot be understood by, you know, electron feeding energy levels anymore. Uh, and uh, it's, it's these, uh, uh, the, the fractional quantum Hall effect, you know, really changed our understanding of quantum phases matter and led to many fields of research since then. And in particular, these fractional quantum effects states that host uh, fractional charges, and these charges have uh, also fractional statistics. They are neither bosons or fermions. Uh, you know, when you exchange two such particles, they take up a phase that's in between zero and pi. And even more dramatically, a certain type of fractional quantum Hall states, so-called uh, non-abelians, uh, they actually, uh, when you exchange two non-abelian particles, uh, you actually can change the quantum state of the system completely, not just uh, picking up a phase factor. And in, uh, you know, my colleague, had, uh, Frank Wilczek, had a nice way of phrasing this. Is that non abelian particles not only know uh, their position, but then, you know, their current position, but also they keep track of their past. So as you braid these particles, uh, you know, the state of the system actually changes. So you can use this to store quantum information, at least theoretically. And there are many research uh, on this fractional quantum Hall effect. And for example, uh, Dima uh, Feldman here uh, proposed uh, one of the uh, uh, very um, early uh, ideas of how to detect this non abelian statistics uh, using electronic uh, Maxana interferometry. So, um, so now that I've told you that this quantum Hall effect could also have, uh, have uh, counterparts in systems uh, zero magnetic field. So naturally, one may wonder if there's also an analog of fractional quantum Hall effect uh, without lambda levels. And uh, about 12 years ago, there was a lot of studies of this uh, possibility in, in toy models. And uh, this is a viewpoint article from back then. Uh, but uh, for a long time, again, we have no clue you know, what kind of material platform is even come close because none of these toy models had any connection with real systems. Um, but then, uh, I think the, uh, really the, the turning moment, the turning point came uh, around uh, a few years ago after the discovery of, uh, of the small ray materials in graphene. So when you put two layers of graphene and you give a magic twist angle, then people observed all kinds of interesting phenomena. Uh, the initial focus uh, from my colleague Pablo's group at MIT was observation of superconductivity and uh, correlated in string states, but then uh, shortly afterwards, experiments from uh, Stanford and from uh, UC Santa Barbara uh, showed that surprisingly, you, you, in this graphene system, which is non-magnetic, right? Graphene carbon is a non-magnetic element. And again, at zero magnetic field, this Hall effect appears. And the Hall effect is very large. And uh, in, uh, at least in some of the devices, the Hall effect is actually quantized. So this shows that quantized into integer. So uh, this at least shows that the integer quantum of Hall effect uh, can appear uh, in magic angle graphene. And uh, uh, also, uh, from two years ago, experiments from Harvard uh, also tried to look for a fractional quantum Hall states in graphene. And uh, now in this case, it turns out uh, this fractional quantum Hall states appears, but only at uh, magnetic fields above six tesla. At uh, fields below then, we actually get a, you know, insulating states that are trivial without any Hall conductance or than zero, okay? But still, uh, these experiments uh, encouraged a lot of theorists and, and experiments to, to look for, look for the, um, the integer and fractional quantum Hall effect at zero field. And here, the general idea is that if you have a, a Moray bands, in these systems, when you have a Moray sublattice structure, the bands are folded into a mini gluon zone and you split into many, many mini bands. And each of these mini bands has a narrow band width. Uh, so it's closer analogy with the lambda levels. Uh, also, in, under the right condition, these mini band can carry turn number uh, in the same way as lambda level does. So that's the general idea. Now, it turned out that uh, what uh, worked in the end uh, is this um, a new material platform. Instead of graphene, these are the, uh, the 
semiconductor transition metal dichocarbonides. So these are uh, two-dimensional semiconductors with a very large energy gap. So uh, one can, uh, by gating, introduce carriers into the valence bands. Uh, and uh, the valence bands has a parabolic dispersion, uh, and just like any ordinary semiconductor. Uh, and uh, they have a relatively large effective mass. So it's ideal platform to look for uh, interaction effects that, that can spontaneously drive uh, ferromagnetism. And uh, um, so uh, a more super lattice can be introduced uh, by, uh, again, placing two layers of these TMD semiconductors on top of each other. Uh, in, and uh, if you take two identical layers of TMDs and introduce a rotational twist, one can form a, a twisted homobile layer and the Moray period uh, is controlled by the twist angle. And uh, uh, interestingly, uh, in these uh, twisted TMD structures, uh, the, uh, uh, the underlying uh, physics is actually quite, uh, quite interesting. So in each layer, uh, the electrons experience a super lattice potential because of the uh, structural modulation, the purity modulation of the structure. At the same time, there's also tunneling between the two layers. And uh, because of the uh, electronic band edge is at the corner of the Brillouin zone, it carries a large crystal momentum, K. Uh, the interlayer tunneling become complex valued. It's not, not real, but it's become complex. And, uh, uh, and, and this comes from basically atomic scale interference uh, due to the K point, uh, the E to the I K R, the, the block phase factor. Uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, the full uh, model for this Mori uh, band was written down uh, by Alan McDonald and his collaborators in 2019. Uh, it's really a very inspiring work. Uh, they showed that uh, uh, that uh, all these complicated uh, Moray electronic structure can be understood by just taking a simple model uh, of two layers. There's a two by two matrix that represents the two layers. The diagonal term delta T and delta B are the potential within each layer. And the off diagonal term is the interlayer tunneling, right? They both vary periodically in space with the periodicity of the Moray structure, okay? Now, if you look at the, uh, this Hamiltonian, uh, you can think of it as a particle moving in a pseudo-magnetic field, a Zeeman field, uh, because the off diagonal elements can be thought as a uh, Zeeman field in the XY plane. But if you think of the layers, you will refer them as a pseudo-spin. Layer one is pseudo-spin up, layer two is pseudo-spin pointing down. Off diagonal term is like a sigma X and sigma Y term. It's like a Zeeman field in the XY plane. And the diagonal term is like sigma Z. So what we end with is basically a, uh, this, this effective model maps into a particle moving in the periodic Zeeman field, right? This, this, this Zeeman field varies both in magnitude and in orientation. And in particular, uh, the, the spatial variation of the uh, pseudo spin uh, is such that they form a skirmion structure in real space, okay? This is starting to get complicated, but, uh, um, but uh, there's one nice thing about the skirmions. Uh, that uh, uh, skirmions create the effective magnetic field. The effective magnetic field, uh, the N represents the direction of the pseudo spin in real space. And uh, uh, the spatial variation uh, give you a chirality term, which is shown here, N dot partial X N cross partial Y N. So this uh, is the equivalence of the, of the magnetic field. So um, as shown by Alan, that uh, uh, in these systems, uh, Indeed, because of the emergent effective magnetic field, uh, the mini bands actually carry Chen numbers in the same way as lambda level does. However, this whole system itself is time rule invariant. So uh, what happens is that the electronic states live in two different valleys, K and K prime. These two valleys, they feel opposite the Zeeman field, the layer pseudo spin Zeeman field, and they have opposite effective magnetic field so we end up with is a peculiar situation that there's effective magnetic field uh, for the K valley uh, that give you a set of Landau levels, the analog of Landau levels. There's also equal and opposite effective magnetic field in the opposite valley that uh, uh, produces another set of Landau levels. So they are completely degenerate. So if you have uh, two electrons per unit cell, which was considered back then, you feel both K and K prime valleys together. So you end with a system that has no net Hall effect, okay, time rules invariant. So um, 
Now, uh, so the first experiment on these twisted hormone bilayers came from the Columbia group and tested WSE2 at a twist angle that is about four degrees, and they showed actually interaction drive the system into an insulin state at half filling, at the filling of one charge per unit cell. So this has to come from interaction effects, so this is what got us uh, interested. And, uh, um, uh, but unfortunately, back then, the experiments didn't find any signal of the Paul effect. So uh, we studied this system, we showed that uh, uh, despite that the underlying bands are topological, um, the bands are quite dispersive, they have a large band width. In this case, spontaneously polarizing all electrons into one valley would cost too much kinetic energy. So we concluded that instead, the electron would occupy both valleys by half, you know, half filling of each valleys, and uh, they form an uh, intervalley coherent state, and that is non-topological. So the two valleys have opposite barrier curvature, opposite electromagnetic field, so, so the whole effect cancel when both valleys are occupied equally. So then, uh, this all also motivated us to consider uh, what happens if you go to smaller twist angles where the bands are more narrow, in this case, we believed that uh, a valley polarized state would be more favorable. And uh, uh, that's how uh, what led us to uh, theoretically uh, uh, consider this system. And uh, um, uh, there's two predictions of the integer and the fractional quantum Paul states uh, in these TMDs. Uh, one is from the uh, Kai Sun and the Shi Zhen Ling's group, uh, and the other is from, from my group. And I'm gonna very briefly use a few minutes to finish this. Um, so basically we look at uh, twist angles below four degrees, and this calculation is for twisted WSE2, and we can see that uh, at the smaller twist angles, the bands, the, the low energy uh, mini bands become quite flat, the band width is only a few milliatron volt, and also the barrier curvature distribution become very, very uniform, so they really resemble uh, on the levels in, in many ways. And uh, um, let me skip this. Um, uh, also, if we compare the energy scales, the energy gap between the first and second mini bands uh, is only order of a few milliliton volt. Uh, if you compare it with a uh, lambda level system, this corresponds to a magnetic field of, of 20 Tesla. So it's known that in modern layer WSE2, uh, the fractional quantum force is, is already observed at a magnetic field of 10 Tesla. So now the question is, could these mini bands at zero field mimic the lambda level and give rise to fractional quantum pole states uh, at fractional filling. Uh, and uh, with my former student, Val, uh, we actually performed the exact translation calculation, and we find that indeed, uh, over a wide range of twist angles and the filling factors, the system is spontaneously valley polarized, spontaneously valley polarized. Now this survived up to you know, uh, almost three degrees, but not at four degrees that were uh, studied before. Uh, and also we found that at the special fillings, at, uh, of these uh, small bands, uh, our exact translation calculation shows that there uh, appears the fractional quantum Hall states, uh, zero magnetic field, okay? And that competes with charge density wave states, uh, and also at other filling factors, the system become metallic, but still valley polarized. So it should still show an unquantized anon Paul effect. So that was the situation a year ago. And then uh, uh, this year, just in the last few months, uh, the uh, multiple uh, experimental reports on the uh, integer and fractional quantum non pole states uh, in, in the system. And uh, the Stanford experiments, for example, focus on WSE2, which is where we did the original calculation, and they indeed find the uh, evidence of the integer quantum Hall effect, uh, direct evidence. Uh, I'm gonna focus, in the interest of time, I'm gonna focus on this twisted uh, bilayer MOT2, which is found to be even more uh, remarkable. And here, uh, Xiao Dong Xu's group at the University of uh, Washington, Seattle, uh, they showed both by optical experiments and by transport, direct transport measurement, that this twisted MOT2 uh, holds, uh, holds integer and fractional quantum anomaly Hall effect. Okay. Uh, and uh, this is the uh, experimental uh, result. Uh, this, is, uh, the, this is the device, what the device looks like. Uh, one can change the carrier density and the displacement field. Uh, in this dual gating uh, device, and uh, this x-axis is the, essentially the filling factor. This is the whole doping, so starting from filling factor zero all the way to filling factor one, uh, and this is the filling factor two-thirds, uh, this is the filling factor one-half. 
and uh, this plot is the RXX, and this plot is RXY. And we can clearly see that the Hall, uh, large Hall effect appears at a thinning factor of two thirds, right? And uh, uh, as well as at a thinning factor of one, right? So at thinning factor one, this is a, uh, a Hall resistance as a function of the pi minor field. Again, you see that zero field Hall effect appears and it's quantized at h over e squared. Uh, and uh, this quantization persists over a range of displacement field, so it's, it's robust. Also, it has a, uh, this effect survives up to, uh, quantization survives up to eight Kelvin, um, which is the highest uh, temperature quantum non small state we have so far. Um, and uh, uh, at a thinning factor of two thirds and at three fifths, uh, you see that the Hawken re resistance is quantized into three over two and five over three. So these are the fractional quantum Hall state zero field, and the quantization uh, persists up to about two Kelvin, which is again, remarkably large, despite zero external magnetic field. Um, so this field is now uh, in, uh, in flux, and uh, there's uh, many uh, theoretical and experimental uh, studies, and uh, I just want to quickly flash our recent uh, uh, theory study uh, with my student, uh, Aiden. Uh, what we sh uh, found, again, by standardization study is that uh, uh, the, the phase space is very, very rich. Uh, at some magic angle, the system really resembles number levels to in great details. In that case, we find that uh, there's a whole sequence. Our calculation shows there should be a whole sequence of fractional quantum Hall states, not only at uh, you know, three-fifths and uh, two-thirds, but also the seventh denominator and ninth denominator fractional states, uh, and uh, they should all fall into the so-called uh, Jane sequence and uh, at a half fitting, there should be a metallic states, which is like the composite Fermi liquid states. On the other hand, at a larger to angle, which we believe is the experimental regime of current devices, we show that uh, uh, some parts of the phase diagram are Landau level like to get a fractional quantum Hall states at two thirds and three fifths. But on the other hand, at one third fitting, we get a, a CDW charge dense wave states, which are topologically trivial. Uh, and we show that uh, between two thirds and thinning factor one, there should be a, a non small metal state. Uh, these are Fermi liquids with spontaneous valley polarization, so it should show an unquantized non small effect. And uh, let me skip this. And uh, um, the, uh, I think one interesting uh, direction is to look for this uh, direct evidence of the uh, half filling composite Fermi liquid states. And uh, uh, this seems to be a very robust uh, state in our. Uh, from our theoretical study, uh, and uh, it's a metallic state, but it should have a, a gap in the tunneling. It's a metallic state, but the gapless degrees of freedom at low energy are not electrons, but electrons attached to uh, vortices. So uh, there should be a tunneling gap. Uh, also, if one do photo emission experiments, one should uh, not expect to see a sharp Fermi surface. Instead of seeing a sharp drop across the Fermi wave lecture, uh, we should see a smooth uh, momentum space distribution. So we, uh, and uh, let me skip this. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so far, you know, uh, as far as my group is concerned, we have only got a chance to only explore this particular cut of the phase diagram as zero displacement field. If we further you now consider uh, the finite displacement field, it drives all kinds of interesting conditions, and uh, some of these are just starting to be uh, explored. So to summarize, uh, that uh, um, in terms of the quantized Hall effects, uh, that uh, in 2013, the integer QH states was observed, and uh, earlier this year, the fractional uh, analog was observed. And uh, these observations are made possible by advances in uh, topological and uh, moray materials. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, Hall effect uh, continues to be a, a source of uh, inspiration for uh, many uh, research areas. And uh, uh, thank you. In the interest of time, maybe we'll just take one or two questions. Right. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's an excellent question. So the question is that uh, at one third fitting, you know, uh, at some twist angles we have a fractional quantum Hall states. At other twist angles we have a, a topological trivial CW states. And it is known that uh, experimentally the twist angle can have some inhomogeneities. That's right. So in that situation, then I expect you know uh, edge states can form some kind of uh, networks, right? The main walls and uh, uh, edge states. That's a, that's a very interesting possibility. Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, a few years ago, I thought uh, yes, that uh, uh, you know we know that skew scattering can certainly cause a second-order response. Uh, you know, either in the transverse channel or in the longitudinal channel, right? Uh, but now, uh, now I think that um, there there should be a way to separate the two. So, in other words, I think skew scattering, at least in uh, non-magnetic materials, uh, the what is generated from the skew scattering uh, should not be called a nonlinear Hall effect. Uh, the nonlinear Hall effect has a feature, uh, at least nonlinear Hall effect. You know, as, as I as I show here, that coming from the barrier curvature. Uh, it guarantees that the, the, when you apply electric field, the current is always, the current generated from the, the nonlinear Hall effect is always perpendicular to the electric field. It's always perpendicular. But if you want to uh, look into the uh, scattering, the disorder scattering, uh, that does not generate this kind of effect. So by looking at the angle dependence, the kind of experiment that Jia Li does, one can separate the nonlinear effect from the intrinsic barrier curvature and the disorder scattering. And that has not been done experimentally yet. Yeah. So that's why I'm, I'm very interested in talking to Jia <laughs> about this angle resolved yeah, transport. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's uh, let everyone go. If you still have questions, uh, Liang can answer them yeah. up front. Yeah. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>